introduction. Um, so I think if there's a popularity contest in this room, I must concede that I've probably already lost that contest. <laughs> um, nevertheless, I am here. I am also passionate about what I'm going to be speaking about. And I'd just like to implore you to have an open mind. And I'll say my bit, and then it's up to you, I suppose, to decide. Um, before I go any further, just some acknowledgements. So I am a recipient of the Cassandra Miller Butterworth Fellowship, which is for Clinician Scientist PhD. Um, I'm also the recipient of the South African National Research Foundation Tatuka Grant, and the grant funds have been used towards my study on Nyaupe users. However, I do, do not have any conflicts of interest. So a brief outline of what I'll be talking about. Um, the cannabinoid system, which has been covered, so I'll just go very briefly over that and then hopefully that will give us more time for questions. I'll be talking about the short-term effects of cannabis use, the long-term effects of cannabis use, and then end with some conclusions and recommendations. So here's a picture that I think is quite beautiful, actually, of the cannabis plant. And I suppose what I'd like to start off by saying, which is a theme that's been from our chairperson and our previous speaker, is that as we look at this picture, I suppose it conjures up different feelings, different emotions, different viewpoints from everybody in this room. For some of you looking at it, you might be thinking, wow, euphoria, joy, satisfaction. For another person, it might be in that complex plant could be the cure to devastating illness that I lost my child to. Um, in the viewpoint of another person like myself in mental health, it could be, oh dear, there are lots of complications within this plant um, that also cause harmful effects. So just briefly, because you've already heard a lot of this, we know that there are three major species to the cannabis plant. There's cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and cannabis ruderalis. Um, and as was mentioned, it's a complex plant, so there's a lot within it. There's said to be about 750 chemicals, and of those chemicals, about 104 have been classified as what we've been hearing about cannabinoids. And the principal cannabinoids that we know about are delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinoid, which is known as THC, cannabidiol, CBD, and cannabinol. Um, when we look at the cannabinoid system, and I think in neuroscience in general, we need to understand neuroscience in the context of many developing medical sciences and understand that it is a newer developing science. When we look at the cannabinoid system in particular, it's a fairly, it could be an infant in the world of understanding endocannabinoid systems or other neurotransmitters in the brain. But we have discovered quite a few things. So what are the sources? Where do these cannabinoids come from? The first one we can say is the phytocannabinoids, which is what we've basically been speaking about here um, so far this morning. And that comes by derived from plants. Um, then we have endocannabinoids that many people might not even realize. So within all of you and me, we have naturally occurring cannabinoids that respond and activate cannabinoid receptors, which I'll talk about just now. And then we have synthetic cannabinoids. Now what are synthetic cannabinoids? Initially, synthetic cannabinoids were created in laboratory environments to better understand, so the ligands are created in research environments to understand what are the effects of the cannabinoid system. Um, however, we are now moving towards trying to understand synthetic cannabinoids and their medicinal purposes, and you also hear briefly about synthetic cannabinoids in terms of novel psychoactive substances and a different way of smoking or inhaling THC. The picture that I have here, just very briefly, is a, is a diagram of what we call a synapse. So when you're understanding um, the brain and what happens in the brain is that we have nerve cells. And this is a, a basic diagram of how those cells communicate with each other. Um, and what it's basically showing you is that one cell is making a communication with another cell via an endocannabinoid, and you'll see there the diamond in red, anandamide. And what happens when these receptors receive the cannabinoid will then lead to longer lasting effects within all systems of the body. It's also important to understand that within cannabinoid receptors, they're not only in the brain, but also in the peripheral tissue as well. 
So THC is the primary psychoactive compound, and it's the cannabinoid that releases the effect that many are trying to seek when they're using a psychoactive substance. Um, we know that it's found in the resin of the flowering tips of the plant as well as in the female um, cannabis plants. What we also know is that there have been an increase in THC concentrations over the years. So the reason for this is that well, people are quite smart and we understand that if we plant things in different ways, for example, a method called Sinsimella where you plant female plants together, you can increase the concentrations of THC found within a plant. Um, and what we see here, for example, in the US, they found that there was less than 2% THC concentration in the 1980s, and in 2008, there was an 8.8% .8 THC concentration found in cannabis sativa. Um, CBD, as we mentioned, is the non-psychoactive compound and tends to modify the effect of THC. However, in cannabis sativa is found in lower concentrations. To speak briefly about the receptors, so when we talk about a chemical compound, we understand that this chemical compound then sits on an actual receptor in order for that chemical to do anything. So we know we've got the CB1 receptor as well as the CB2 receptor. The CB1 receptor is considered to have a role in motivation, cognition, synaptic plasticity, which basically means regrowth of, of tissue, synapses, cell migration, and neuronal growth. Um, the CB2 receptor, which is something that's more studied in terms of medicinal purposes, may have a role in terms of general protective mechanisms. Um, and they're also expressed in things like circulating immune cells, macrophages, microbial cells. All right, so now to go on to different preparations of cannabis. And my talk is focused on the recreational or non-medical use of cannabis. I think we've already heard enough about the medical use, but I think it's very relevant to talk about other ways that cannabis is used and what are the outcomes or the effects of that use. So in terms of marijuana, so marijuana is the plant, also known as zaka and sango, weed, many names in different parts of the world. And generally it's prepared from the dried flowering tops and leaves. And it tends to be smoked in a joint or a zor with mixed with tobacco. Um, more recently, there's also an increased use in terms of vaporizing effects uh, or methods of smoking marijuana. Then we have hashish. Um, when cannabis resin is smoked or ad used as a food additive, um, in Asian areas, it's actually smoked more in clay pipes. Hashish oil is slightly different in the sense that it's a, a solvent is used to extract <coughs> liquid. Um, and this can be smoked, vap vaporized, or as a food additive. And hashish oil is said to have much higher levels of THC. The synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonist is the one that I was just mentioning in terms of novel psychoactive substances. Um, so initially, agonists were created in terms of research purposes. However, people decided, uh, began to understand that these synthetic agonists actually have very potent agonists of cannabinoid receptors, um, up to 100 times more potent than THC that would be found in cannabis sativa. Um, and so this was obviously something then that could be marketed and sold to people that are seeking a particular kind of high. Um, they, they termed legal highs because synthetic cannabinoids tend to be sold on the internet. They're not under any kind of regulatory control. Um, and Recent occurrences of people using this has led to case reports of very serious outcomes like cardiac arrest, seizures. The way it's actually sold is, uh, there's a picture here of things called spice, K2. The actual chemical is sprayed onto dried cannabis leaves and sold so that when the person inhales or uses the substance, they have a mixture of the effect of the, the dried cannabis leaf with the synthetic cannabinoid on top. I don't have too much time to go into epidemiology, but I think that it is important to have an idea of what is the epidemiology behind um, cannabis use. So cannabis is the most commonly used psychoactive substance found under international control. Um, and it was estimated that in 2013, there are at least 181 million people between the ages of 15 and 64 that use cannabis for non-medical purposes. Um, in many developed and developing countries, the number of persons seeking treatment for cannabis use disorder has increased since the 1990s. 
So here are terms that I think I'm going to try and explain um, because cannabis use versus cannabis use disorder or cannabis dependence are very different concepts. Um, so I initially spoke about just the general use of cannabis when I mentioned the most commonly used. Cannabis use dis disorder, which I will define a little bit later, is a disorder that would be diagnosed in the medical space. Um, and then bringing it to South Africa, what do we know about how many people or who uses cannabis in South Africa? So the South African Youth Risk Behaviour Survey found that 12.8% of South African students between, the age of the, between grade 8 and 10 use cannabis and 9.2% of them had used it in the past month. In the Western Cape, grade 8 and 10 students uh, they found that there was 23.6% of them that had a lifetime use of cannabis. And you'll see later on why it is that we tend to emphasize or talk so much about use of cannabis in adolescence. Um, the South African Stress and Health Survey was a survey done um, that basically tried to look at the general population of South Africa. So we're not looking at people within rehabs, we're not looking at people within hospitals, but general population to understand what is the epidemiology of substance use there. And they found that 8.4% um, had a cannabis life, had lifetime use of cannabis. Um, Sakindu, which is the, the graph that you have there, is um, the South African Community Network um, assessing epidemiology of drug use. And what Sakindu does is they track what uh, people entering rehabilitation facilities where questionnaires or surveys are conducted to see what are the trends of use over time. And this is data from July and December last year. Sakendo has been collecting data from about the 1990s. And what you see there is um, the percentage of people that reported cannabis as their primary substance of use when entering rehab. We see that in Kauteng for under 20s, the under 20 year old age group, about 80% had said that cannabis was their primary substance of use. And if you look at the entire sample, it was 41% that said that cannabis was their primary substance of use. And this definitely differs, as you can see, depending on um, which province we're looking at. So I'm going to get right into it then in terms of the health effects. And the short-term effects is what we would refer to as something like an intoxicating effect. So when you use cannabis, what is the immediate feeling or experience that somebody has? And I'm not going to deny that obviously there's wonderful aspects to the intoxicating effect, but that's not my purpose here today. Um, I need to also inform of what might be some of the more harmful consequences of intoxicating effects. Um, so, cognition and coordination. Cognition um, in, in neurosciences is what we refer to as cognitive function or higher function. So, if we look at the frontal lobe, which is the biggest lobe of our brain, it's the area where a lot of what we call executive function, higher order thinking, such as planning, sequencing of events, um, you know, in terms of integrating different parts of the brain activity happen. Um, and what, we, what research has found, and I just need to mention that a lot of my data is taken from a WHO 2015 document that looks at health and social consequences of cannabis use. Um, and what we find is that cannabis acutely impairs a broad range of executive function, although the effect is not consistently observed. So um, studies that show that you know, cannabis creates changes in attention, concentration, reaction time, memory, um, particularly short-term memory, episodic memory, um, have found that the effects tend to be worse in somebody that's not an experienced cannabis user and that there's a dose-response relationship. So the higher the dosage of the person using the cannabis, uh, the higher uh, of THC concentration in the blood, the more severe the cognitive impairment during a period of intoxication. Then we're going to talk about motor coordination. And um, road traffic accidents is something that often comes up as something that we need to think about um, when we're looking at policy or what can happen, what are the effects of people smoking cannabis and then driving. And to summarize many, many studies that have been done on this, I would say that what they found is a small causal impact of cannabis on traffic injury. Um, I'm going to go a little bit technical now and try and explain how we appraise research. So can I actually say that cannabis causes depression or cannabis causes schizophrenia or cannabis causes cognitive impairment? 
in a research atmosphere, there are about four main criteria that one has to fulfill in order to create a causal relationship. And it's actually quite difficult for research to fulfill all those criteria. The first one would be to say that there's an association found between the substance or between the, the thing that you are testing and the outcome. And that association needs to be found consistently um, and it needs to be found in a variety of different settings. So the one setting that we often look at is animal model, animal based studies. We would also then look at epidemiological research and something like smoking and lung cancer where you see repeatedly something being found in many settings. The second thing that we need to say is that there shouldn't be a reverse relationship. So I can't say that the opposite is actually true. So is it that cannabis makes you depressed or is it that depressed people use cannabis? And so you have to be able to accurately say that actually the reverse is not true. The third criteria that we need to look at is in terms of confounders. And this is where medical research in general, and I suppose in psychiatric research and addiction research becomes even more complicated. So is it the effect of the cannabis that is causing the road traffic accident? Or is it because the person also had alcohol that night, is also of a certain age category, is also of a different socioeconomic status? And so all of those factors need to be taken into account. Um, in the instance of you know, reverse causation, the way we can understand that is by looking at things like prospective longitudinal studies, which is basically saying, let's look at this over a period of time and examine the relationship of what comes when. So if the cannabis use is clearly preceding the onset of an outcome, then perhaps you can be more confident in saying cannabis is causing this. With confounders' ways of dealing with such difficulties, it's quite hard, is often by statistical analysis. So in statistical analyses, we have to, call, co we have to control for certain variables. Um, and then the fourth thing that we need to be able to do when we're looking at association or causation is to be able to say that this is biologically plausible. So if I'm going to say something like cannabis can have an effect on road traffic accidents, there should be a biological basis for that. For example, we understand the fact that there are CB1 receptors in the frontal lobe of the brain, that THC can activate these receptors and thereby biologically it would make sense um, that this could be an outcome. So when I say that there's a small causal impact of cannabis on traffic injury, it's because there have been pooled data of many studies that had to fulfill those four criteria to make that kind of um, conclusion. Um, and what we do find is that cannabis can interfere with driving skills and increase the risk of injuries, that driving while intoxicated may double the risk of motor vehicle accidents. Um, and so a big study that's often uh, quoted when talking about road traffic accidents is one that was done in France where they compared <coughs> 6,766 um, culpable and 3,006 non-culpable drivers. Um, and trying to understand what was the role of cannabis in these accidents found that culpability was higher in drivers which THC greater than one nanogram per mole. Um, and also reported that there was a dose response relationship for THC and culpability which persisted after controlling for things like blood alcohol level, age, and time of accident. This is also an area that I, I really believe needs more research. Um, as we say, this is very new information that we're starting to look at, and it's still early days um, in making specific conclusions. So then the intoxicating effect, and what about anxiety and psychotic symptoms? You know, um, many cannabis users in the room would say, I don't get psychotic, I don't get anxious. What does the, the literature say about anxiety and psychotic symptoms? A minority of first time users become anxious, have panic attacks and may vomit. And it's found that hallucinations uh, tend to increase if somebody has an underlying predisposition to psychosis. A predisposition could mean numerous things. One of the common predispositions would be a genetic factor. So if they have a genetic risk for psychosis, those people smoking it might then be at higher risk. Um, what about toxicity? Because we know that with many other substances, there are concerns. If you drink excessive amounts of alcohol in one go, you could die. If you have excessive amounts of heroin, you could overdose. What is the case with cannabis? So fatal cannabis overdose by smoking of leaves and flowering tops is actually quite rare. Um, they are not, you know, 
many cases reported on that. However, what's of concern within the addiction or health space is the emerging data on cases of death from synthetic cannabinoids. So the novel psychoactive substances that I was talking about, um, and it's, it's still early, so we don't have enough data on this, but what we do know, for example, is that in 2015, the state of Mississippi um, was collecting data, and they found that 1,200 synthetic cannabinoid-related emergency visits um, and 17 of those caused deaths. Um, in the Alabama Department of Public Health reported more than 1,000 such emergency visits and five such deaths. So it is something that really needs to be monitored.